Hi, I'm Paul Carroll. I'm the editor in chief at Insurance Thought Leadership. I'm delighted to be here today with Mick Maloney, who is the global head of insurance at and asset management at Oliver Wyman, and always one of my favorite people to to talk to. Um, Mick is doing a uh, the basically keynote panel with the um, with a series of CEOs in insurance at the Global Insurance Forum, and um, has a number of, of interesting thoughts that I want to try to get to today about uh, what we're calling the Great Reset. And we've gone through this craziness with COVID in particular over the last two and a half years, but there are an awful lot of, of other things going on with in, inflation and war in Europe and so forth and so on. So um, Mick, welcome. Uh, maybe to start us off, you could just talk a little bit about um, the panel and and the thoughts you're getting to uh, in terms of what this massive reset is that we're, we're going through. Yeah, uh, great to be here, Paul. Uh, 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 delighted, uh, delighted we can have this conversation. But yeah, the so we have three uh, CEOs joining the uh, the panel, which, which uh, I think collectively give a uh, just a terrific perspective across um, both the life in PNC sector uh, and obviously then in, in terms of kind of views globally from their their different businesses. So we we have Mario Greco, uh, the CEO of uh, Zurich Insurance, which. As everybody knows, is is a um, you know a global multi line and, and and really one of the uh, one of the insurance powerhouses. We have Kevin Strain, the uh, recently appointed CEO of uh, Sun Life, uh, and obviously Sun have a, a global footprint in the um, in the life insurance space and are, are building out a number of uh, a number of businesses kind of uh, adjacent to that. Uh, and then uh, Chris Townsend uh, with uh, Allianz. Chris runs a you know a very significant portion of Allianz's uh, global uh, kind of PNC and uh, and reinsurance businesses. So between the three of them, I think we have a we have a very good view across the the insurance sector um, and uh, the kind of major subsectors and and across the uh, the world. And then, as as you said, the the theme of of uh, this year's uh, conference is really this idea of the uh, the great reset. Um, and you know, in in one way, I think you can you can look at where we are in in terms of the uh, the pandemic and emerging from the pandemic, uh, and obviously then you know the the uh, situation as we have it in in terms of the uh, the war in Ukraine and the and the impact that that's had globally, but also then uh, you know more more broadly in in terms of some of the um, Themes that are playing out, obviously, then in, in terms of uh, kind of you know monetary policy and and the, the pickup in in inflation and what governments are doing globally with kind of bond yields, which obviously has a, a big impact on uh, on insurers. And then the, the themes you know we're looking at broadly, and I know we'll, we'll get into these in a little bit uh, more detail, are that you know how should CEOs and and um, uh, kind of executive teams be positioning their enterprises given the, the kind of volume of change that's there globally currently. Um, you know, embedded in that is, is this idea that how should they be balancing uh, risks and also positioning their enterprise for, for growth and, and transformation. And hidden in that, I think, is a view that you and I have, have talked about before that, you know, there's a somewhat of a, a dichotomy that the industry is facing in, in that there are lots and lots of emerging risks and lots and lots of unmet needs for protection on the part of society and, and corporates. And yet you can certainly look at uh, you know, significant subsets of the industry and um, you know, think that they have been challenged to unlock that growth. Uh, so we're, we're kind of asking questions about how that might, uh, how that might change uh, going forward. And then just given where we are, you know, there, there's also a set of topical questions around, uh, you know, what will the permanent or semi-permanent uh, kind of um, uh, consequences of the, the pandemic be in terms of, uh, you know, search for talent, retention, uh, kind of working and, and uh, you know, this kind of new hybrid uh, work mode. So, so plenty to cover, a really great panel to, uh, to cover it with. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the, uh, the discussion with that. So basically everything, and you're providing all the answers, and nobody needs to, you know, look at anything else after that. I don't know about all the answers, but we'll certainly cover a lot of ground in the forty or forty-five minutes we'll uh, we'll have together. So as long as they're not here, you get to you know channel your inner uh, uh, insurance company CEO and uh, answer the questions for them. And it it does strike me that this is one of these really interesting times. Uh, 
when there's an awful lot going on in the way of growth opportunities, but there's also an awful lot of risk out there. I mean, get it right and you're golden, get it wrong and, and you're suffering for a while. So as you, in your consulting practice, uh, talk to a lot of these CEOs, how do you see them balancing this attempted growth versus the need to avoid risks? Yeah, and as, as you know, the... You know what, I, what I'm always conscious of saying to people is that we 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 talk about the insurance industry globally, but really, as as I think about it, there are a number of subsectors that are actually in very different positions. As as you uh, as you think about that question, that there's the you know the, the life industry broadly, and particularly the life industry in in the kind of Western uh, kind of developed markets uh, that um, you know is very challenged for growth, has been in a mode of returning capital to shareholders uh, at. Uh, scale for for a significant period of time and, and needs to position as it goes forward. And I'll, I'll come back to each of these. There's the property and casualty sector, which you know, there are obviously the auto and home players in the market. There are the there are the kind of commercial PNC players. The the inflation uh, is obviously a kind of a very big concern for those businesses, uh, particularly in in the uh, in the retail space. The, the, there's also, as you well know, the, you know the, the kind of hard market cycle that's been playing out for a number of years now, and arguably in, in certainly in the in the kind of property space and, and particularly property cat in the uh, in the Americas is may, may be about to get even harder. It, it kind of represents a different set of uh, a different set of dynamics there. There are the brokers uh, who really have had a, a terrific run uh, and are kind of still significantly rated for growth and, and have a, a different set of issues that they're facing. And then there's kind of a surrounding set of private equity players that are, are kind of encroaching on the space and, and playing in uh, in various different ways in life and in PNC and in uh, and in broking. And I, I would say, look, as I, as I think about the the discussions we're having with uh, with kind of C suites across that, the the life sector I think is looking forward to a little bit of relief from higher rates, uh, which is obviously kind of one of the uh, one of the consequences of, of what's happening, which should see some improvement in. Um, uh, kind of profitability on uh, on new business, they they, as you know, I think are probably the most acutely in need of transformation generally. And I I, I think the tension we see as we're talking to CEOs there is an awareness of the need to generate more growth, uh, a hope for some relief from a kind of rising rate environment, a knowledge that that's probably still not enough, and then this issue, and you and I have spoken spoken about this. You know, if if you take the large public uh, life insurers in the U.S. as an example, they have returned somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of their current market caps to shareholders by way of dividends and share buybacks over the last 10 years. So have very much been in a mode of, of kind of returning capital. And this idea that they will need to invest uh, at scale to generate transformation, I, I think is front of mind for them, but I, I think is also a very delicate balance that they're, they're trying to trade off. So, so that's life w within PNC. I, I think it's, you know, generally a more positive uh, picture in, in that they're you know somewhat better rated for growth I, I think they're kind of examples of, of companies out there that have kind of done extremely well and are, are, are kind of facing you know uh, kind of positioned well but I think sitting in the middle of that obviously is this question of of where am I happy to deploy risk capital uh, and the tension there is I have a hardening market but I also have a very uncertain uh, kind of uh, environment, whether it's inflation or impacts to global supply chains, or you know, at, at, yeah, will I be able to find reinsurance capacity where I actually write something in the in the primary market and then don't want to to want to hold on to all that risk? And I would say there, yeah. in, in, inside those businesses, I, I think the other thing we're seeing is just look, a I need to be I need to be positioning for growth where I, where the market is, is still looks favorable to me. Equally, I need to be looking internally at, at things like efficiency and, and we're seeing a lot of focus on underwriting and, and kind of claims transformation in particular. Um, on, the, on the broker side, I, I think in, in general, it, it's still a very positive environment. I, I, I would say everybody is, is you know, making sure that they're, the organization is kind of fit and doesn't have uh, excess costs sitting inside it, but the, the revenue, revenue trajectory still looks pretty good. Uh, and then the, the, in, the, in the private equity side, we've really just seen a, a, um, a huge focus. Uh, I, and again, as you and I have spoken about, Paul, on, on, on the, 
within the life sector, uh, you know, the, the last five years have, have really seen, uh, our, you know, arrival of a lot of private equity players. I, I think that will continue to be the case going forward and that they see a very significant opportunity in, in balance sheets for kind of funding their, their core operations. And then on the broker side, we've seen a significant amount by way of kind of broker roll up uh, that it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, my suspicion again is that that will uh, continue. So sorry, a very long answer to your question, but I, I think the dynamics are, are complicated with lots for, for, uh, for kind of boards and, uh, and exec teams to, uh, to think about. Yeah, no, I agree. You showed me a couple of fascinating charts the other day about uh, how the, the brokers are very much in that sort of magic magic quadrant, as uh, Gartner labels it, uh, the upper right, and the, the life insurers are very much in the lower left, and uh, there seems to be a lot that, that has to go on. <clears throat> One of the things that's intrigued me in terms of innovation in insurance is the, the rise of the MGAs, right? I mean, it, it seems like uh, insurers are sort of figuring out the asset light model <clears throat> that's popular in, in Silicon Valley. You know, Airbnb doesn't own the premises. It just coordinates the rental. Uh, Uber doesn't own the cars and so forth. WeWork actually got into trouble because they went ahead and, and had long leases on the office space. So they kind of owned it. I think back, I, I actually, um, I know a guy who almost invented eBay. Uh, the problem is that he actually did it with assets. He was taking delivery of things and um, uh, and then you know sending them out to people and so forth. So he wasn't fully asset light. I mean, he, he sold his business for a hundred million dollars. So we don't need to feel bad for him. And he actually introduced me to my wife. So I'm I'm personally grateful to him. But anyway, um, that that's a long way of posing this question about sort of. Uh, uh, the potential for asset light models and uh, innovation of that sort in the insurance industry. Yeah, I, I yeah, it's it's. It, it, let me kind of un unpack it a little bit as as I see it, and and uh, and you 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 obviously have have kind of lots of views and, and insights into the space as well. I mean, I, I would say, in general, this theme of um, you know, can I find ways to generate profit? beyond just deploying capital uh, kind of has, has been a question for the last five or 10 years, I would say. I, I, I think on the, you know, the, the way it's emerged, I think has kind of looked slightly different across life and, and uh, PNC. And it's, as, as you say, it's possible to look at what are really services businesses uh, and, and those can be brokers. They can also be, uh, you know, TPAs. They can also be downstream businesses in, in terms of kind of, uh, kind of claims processing and so forth. And look at those and observe much higher profitability and and kind of higher PEs as an as an indicator for growth than it is when you look at what have traditionally been the balance sheet businesses in in life and PNC, and I I I think as I look at it the 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 MGA trend I, I think is an example of that in that you look at it and say look what what, what is it it's it's you know typically taking a um, you know, an underwriting team from a, uh, a kind of a PNC player where that underwriting team thinks that they have uh, a lot of expertise, generally speaking, within a, a relatively niche area. And then they, they move into an environment where they have, a, you know, an ecosystem that rewards them very directly for the value that they, they generate in an environment where they're not dealing with as much kind of corporate architecture as they are in a big PNC player, where either they themselves have found or they're sitting inside an organization that, that has uh, kind of a, a platform for them that is backing in uh, kind of risk capital from a uh, kind of from elsewhere, or e either from elsewhere within a group or elsewhere in, in terms of kind of third party uh, capital. And, and in a way, I kind of look at it and think it, it's really underwriting on steroids then because what it's effectively saying is look the value they're going to be judged on the value that they generate purely by the, the underwriting result on what they've done um, and as long as they do a good job of that they will be rewarded and they will they will continue to have access to uh, to capital uh, now I, I i i think if if you kind of zoom out and and look at it across the space i what i actually see is that there's there are kind of two things happening at once. One is an unbundling in terms of, you know, what I describe as the underwriting unbundling, the M MGA trend. It, the other one is actually this almost doubling down on uh, balance sheet businesses where, and, and that's really the, the private equity uh, kind of piece, particularly as it relates to the life space in that, you know, the, the challenge that they've posed for incumbents is that they've, they've flipped the model from, I am an insurer 
uh, kind of selling policies and originating liabilities, and I have a general account, and I have an investment function for that general account, but I am primarily an insurer, and, se and secondly, this is something that I do as part of that business. The private equity model flips that on its head and says, my primary business is originating and structuring various different things. One of the channels through which I deploy that is through an insurance balance sheet. And the, the model for competition then is, can I source and structure uh, assets where I think I'm at an advantage in terms of a risk adjusted spread, deploy those into a market where I am more competitive on pricing or features as a result. And the total of that for me is still something that's better for my, my kind of stakeholders and shareholders in terms of my ability to kind of keep enough of that risk adjusted spread in my core model to have the whole thing look attractive. And I, I so I, I see both things. The, the issue for the, for the incumbent carriers then across both pieces is that, you know, if, if I'm a, if I'm a, a kind of PNC, traditional PNC carrier, I, I, I've had to keep an eye on the loss of underwriting talent to the MGA model and, and an ability to say, look, how much of that can I retain and how should I go about, you know, neutralizing some of the, some of the, uh, some of the issue that's causing this. And on the life side of things, you know, it, it's, it's really been, you know, are there ways that I can restructure and rethink how I operate in order to move toward the private equity model? And to the extent that I have any concerns with, with the model itself, how can I mitigate those? And, and we've seen particularly on the, on the life side in, in, um, in the US, you know, just a, a um, huge number of, of the incumbents setting up uh, Bermuda reinsurers, for example, having a rethink about how they do asset management in a number of cases, actually uh, outsourcing uh, some of the asset management to private equity players in, in terms of uh, looking to kind of directly source that, that kind of advantage in the, uh, in the structure. So yeah, it, it, it's a, um, you know, we, we, we had an, we have, we've had an idea for a lot of years that there's a, you know, it, it's possible to modularize financial services now in a, in a much greater way than it has been, you know, it would have been a decade ago. And, and these two things I think are examples of that. Yeah, and sort of choose your lane. Um, I've been preaching for a while about sort of an API model where you have modules and you, as you, as you say, and you can sort of, you know, sap them together in ways that you couldn't before because the, the digital connections allow you to do things with other organizations that previously you had to do uh, internally. Um, so th this is all uh, fascinating. Um, maybe the, the final thing I'll ask you about is the fact that you're in the office. Uh, I, I can see it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm at home, but we're in this mode where some people are going back to the office, some people aren't. We talked the other day about consulting where the, uh, the model always was fill the skies with suits, <clears throat> you know, send people off to uh, uh, where they're going to do the work. So uh, how do you see that all shaking out for Oliver Wyman, uh, for consulting businesses, and in particular for insurers as people start to... Uh, uh, to make their way back to the office in some way, shape, and form. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I got pretty comfortable at home. I would say uh, for the uh, for the pandemic, and it was certainly very efficient. I, I think in in terms of uh, lack of travel and the ability to move seamlessly from one Zoom meeting to the next, as I'm sure you did. I, I, I am. Um, You're certainly looking very fit. Well, <laughs> there was a lot of tennis. <laughs> the, uh, but I, you know. What we at least have found, and it, I, I think this is true across the industry, is, is that um, you know different subsegments of our population uh, are reaching for different points on the balance spectrum between in person and remote, and, and in particular, being a consulting business, you'll appreciate we we bring in a lot of uh, a lot of people every year uh, as we kind of grow, and and the the younger folks, we we certainly had a. You know what would best be described, I, I think, as a uh, an apprenticeship model where they kind of learn from being with people, and in particular, learn from kind of being with senior people and, and seeing how they behave. So we we've got a subset of our group that are reaching for more in person uh, interaction, and and you know the the rest of the system, I, I think, is trying to accommodate that, while also preserving the, the the benefit of the remote model for those who have families and live in suburbs and and just like the, uh, the flexibility. I don't think we'll ever get back to the four days a week on client site. And in, in fact, a lot of what we're doing at the moment is we're co-locating our teams, but they're co-locating in our offices rather than at client sites. Um, I do see, you know, as I'm sure you do, 
you know, there is now much more interaction, I, I think, in terms of lunches and dinners and, and people being happy to take meetings and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that uh, kind of happening again. Um, across the industry generally, I would, it's funny, just a, a, an observation rather than anything else, but I, I think the, the property and casualty sector, I think, is a far more in-person sector than the life sector is an observation I have at this point, and that it seems to be returning faster. Yeah, I'm headed to the uh, CIA, CIAB meeting uh, at the at the weekend in uh, Colorado Springs, and you know, I, I think there'll be a thousand people there for the first time uh, since the pandemic, which will, will be really uh, terrific to see. But I, look, I think we're seeing a mix of things on the part of clients. We're, we're, we're kind of trying to balance it. And I, I, I'm actually hopeful we, we keep the hybrid piece. I, I, I would say that, you know, and, and you're looking at our office here behind us, that we renovated just in time for the, uh, for the pandemic to start. Okay. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think corporate spaces haven't quite adjusted to what's optimal for uh, kind of hybrid work just yet, I think, which is, again, something we may see more of going forward. But look, I, I'm... Uh, I'm happy to say I'm trying to preserve some kind of balance. I'm, I'm here about two or three days a week, depending on what's going on, and, and equally then remote. And it, you know, so far so good. Well, good. Um, this is fascinating as always. I appreciate your taking the time. I encourage people to check out the uh, session you will be doing with the, the CEOs at the Global Insurance Forum, and uh, in general lean into that content. I mean, we've all watched a lot of webinars and Zoom meetings and interviews and that sort of thing here over the pandemic. But I really do think this is a pivotal time for uh, the economy, for the world in general, and in f for insurance in particular. So I, I, I love this theme of the Great Reset and it's a, a quite interesting selection of uh, sessions that will be there at the forum. So um, don't just uh, you know check out Mick, um, uh, but uh, but take a look at, at all those sorts of sessions. I, I would say, and uh, I think you'll get a lot out of them. So people will have a way at the end here to get in touch with you. I encourage them to to do that. Uh, check out Insurance Thought Leadership, uh, in particular the weekly newsletter I do called Six Things, and uh, stay tuned. Thanks, Mick. Thanks very much, Paul. Appreciate it.